So first of all, let me just say thank you very much to the organisers, to Anton and Maxime for the invitation to, um, to speak here today um, and to attend this really marvellous um, conference this week in, in honour of Samson. So I've known Samson uh, as a colleague and a friend um, for nearly 20 years now in Trinity. Um, so in the, that time we've had many interesting physics discussions, I think, um, but we've also fought many battles uh, together uh, with our university administration, or against our university administration, I should say. So in that sense, uh, we have worked very closely together, even if not as uh, collaborators in uh, physics topics. So uh, I work in Lattice QCD, so uh, a little bit uh, tangential, I suppose, to the main topic and thrust of this workshop, although of course still within the, um, the theme of a uh, quantum field theory, and, and somehow still if you stretch it a little bit within the theme of integrability, although here we're talking about numerical integration, so it's a, a little bit different, I grant you. Okay, so, um, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so, just to start, I found some pictures from Samson's nearly 20 years in Trinity. So, uh, Leon already showed this one uh, this morning. So, this is uh, Samson in his academic robes in front square with people that, of course, you recognise. Um, but this one, uh, you won't maybe recognise the people. This is Samson on the occasion of the award of his gold medal from the Royal Irish Academy for his contributions to science. Uh, this woman in the middle here is Mary McAleese, who's a president of Ireland and awarded the medal at the time. And I have to confess, I have no idea who that person is, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I apologise. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. One in mathematics and one in humanities. So this, this is okay. <laughs> so Nana knows far better than I do already. <laughs> So these are some highlights, of course, from uh, Samson's time in Trinity. But uh, I should also point out that Samson lives on campus. As many of you know, he's uh, very warm and uh, hospitable. And I've had uh, the occasion, his, his uh, apartment is on this side over here somewhere. Uh, so I've been invited many times by Samson and Masha to, to spend an evening uh, with them. And in the, we've listened to good music, we've discussed somewhat uh, esoteric literature, <laughs> lubricated always by some uh, very nice beverages. Um, but I also found this one, I, th so this building is the oldest uh, surviving building on the Trinity main campus. It's called the Rubrics, where Samson lives. Uh, and so there's some history which I discovered, which I don't know whether you already knew this Samson or not. But in 1932, a group of students who became particularly annoyed with a fellow, uh, of which Samson of course also is of Trinity, um, apparently did what all rational types do, so this is from a uh, history of the time, uh, gathered a mob outside his window and shot him. <laughs> so uh, it, it, apparently nobody was, uh, nobody was arrested and held responsible for this uh, particular murder because they were all in costume and they weren't identifiable, however the group of students was expelled. So, the fellow's last name was Ford. I think that's right, yes, <laughs> yes. Very common name. So it's much more peaceful these days, uh, at least normally. Uh, okay, so I, as I said already, as advertiser, I will talk on Lattice QCD. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the methods that we use um, to evaluate observables in this uh, quantum field theory um, and try to give you a sense of some of the progress that's being made and the challenges that remain uh, in the topic. Okay, so this is a cartoon of the phase diagram. So to understand fully uh, QCD, one should, uh, of course any theory, one should try to map out the phase diagram. Um, and so this is the phase diagram in the chemical potential, the baryon chemical potential and the temperature. Um, and, and what we know is in fact quite limited, or at least what we know from, from first principles is quite limited. It's certainly limited, as I'll discuss uh, in a little bit more detail um, soon, it's limited in particular to this temperature axis here. So we understand quite well how to formulate the theory and how in a discrete and numerical simulation to, uh, to calculate observables and to properties of the theory uh, at zero chemical potential. So as you go out in chemical potential, uh, as I'll allude in a little while, you'll see that this becomes an extremely difficult problem. In fact, it's a, an unsolved problem 
to understand how to make calculations at finite chemical potential. In Brookhaven National Lab, we're building an electron ion yes. collider. Is there any place? Yes. Uh, yes, so the EIC, so this is Rick, the en this is Rick is up here doing an energy scan, and, and EIC will, will certainly be probing higher energies and higher temperatures, yes. Um, so there's a lot of interest from the lattice community for the EIC physics, for sure, absolutely. Um, so one thing that, so in lattice calculations, as I said, you can formulate the, the, the theory in a thermal field theory background and you can make calculations at finite temperature. In fact, that's, uh, that's done, although it comes with particular challenges in its own right. Um, and you can, if you're, uh, if you're brave, you can try to venture out a little bit into this uh, non-zero chemical potential plane. And uh, those people who have done this have been able to at least make some baby steps in this direction and you see those lines dotted there and then establish that the transition here is uh, a crossover, for example. So this was a contribution from lattice calculations. But you see that there's a rather a large amount of the, the phase diagram that remains, uh, at least for the moment, uh, inaccessible to us. Okay, so what can we do? Um, so the QCD, of course, is a quantum field theory in fundamental variables, which are the quarks and gluons, and is a building block of the standard model, which, whose parameters you can see gathered here. So just a few short words on the standard model. I won't say very much about this, except, of course, to remind you that this is embarrassingly successful. Uh, and despite uh, huge efforts, certainly from the experimental community, uh, this in some sense is not broken yet. Uh, and in fact, this motivates QCD people even more because the precision tests, so new physics has not, uh, has not been immediately or directly ex accessed yet in experiments. And so looking for signs of new physics in indirectly through precision tests of standard model variables uh, is more important than ever. And in fact, QCD plays a, a role in those precision tests. It also remains the only experimentally studied strongly interacting quantum field theory, so one gets to learn quite a lot about such strongly acting theories in a regime where, at least in principle, there are some benchmarks and experimental tests that one can check your results against. So it provides us with a paradigm for strongly interacting theories, for example, in uh, beyond the standard model physics. And I should also say it's important to note that this is not, in some sense, a, a solved problem. There are still very many puzzles and surprises uh, that we don't understand, uh, even though in some sense we, uh, we know uh, a lot about the theory. So just to highlight um, some progress, so this is a, this is a typical, if you, if you have been to colloquia in uh, particle physics, either theory or experiment phenomenology, you'll see plots that look like this. These are the parameters of the CKM matrix. Um, and so they parameterize the sort of the known standard model. Uh, if the standard model is complete as a unitary theory, then the triangle that you see here meets at the apex, the lines meet at the apex. And the error bands, the colored bands, give you a sense of the uncertainty and the parameters that go into uh, making up this triangle. So you see that the bands are certainly wide enough here that uh, it's not yet uh, fully proven that indeed this is unitary, or indeed fully proven that it's not unitary. The bands are the combination of experimental and theoretical uncertainty, and by and large, most of the bands that you see here uh, are driven by hadronic uncertainty, in particular theoretical uncertainty that comes from the QCD contribution to this combination of electroweak and strong interacting physics. So it is uh, the job of QCD theorists to, uh, to shrink the size of these bands to understand um, more about the CKM matrix, in particular the unitarity or not of the CKM matrix. And over here, this rather, uh, I apologize, this is a little bit small and, and certainly hard to read on the axis, so don't worry about that. So this is a sort of a universality plot in some sense. This is a collection of lattice calculations of many um, low-lying mesons and baryons. Um, the different, the black lines, so first of all, are the experimental measurements. The different colored uh, dots are different lattice calculations. So these are done in many different ways. The fact that they all sit on these black lines is confirmation that although we do things in very different ways, uh, everything is agreeing very nicely with these low-lying measured experimental states. And this is true for light. These are light mesons and baryons, heavy light mesons, and heavy, heavy mesons and baryons. There's some offset here, which I haven't included on the plot. 
So everything works very nicely, at least for this, uh, this level. There are also, it, you need rather good eyes, but there are also some error bars on here, and this is the result of the numerical simulation, of course, which has both statistical and systematic uncertainties that go along with it. So for QCD, we know that uh, essentially you can think about uh, two regimes in QCD. So there's a high energy regime, so deep inside a proton, where the quarks are uh, essentially free. We asymptotic freedom tells us that the theory is perturbative and in fact perturbation theory works very well in that regime. However, we also know that the coupling, the strong coupling in QCD runs and so at length scales that are of order the proton, for example, so at uh, lambda QCD is about 300 MeV, um, the coupling, which you can see, I mean, by some sort of lazy inversion, which I've done here, so you just reflect this plot. So this is in, uh, plotted, this is the running coupling as a function of the momentum transfer, so Q squared. If you just flip this, reflect this plot around and just relabel the axes in terms of the corresponding uh, distances, so Fermi, you see that already by about 0.2 Fermi, the strong coupling is really strong, so it's about 0.5, and by the time you get to uh, one Fermi, which is sort of so hadronic length scales, then this is a, quite a large number and is certainly no longer an appropriate uh, variable for a perturbative expansion. So a non-perturbative expansion, a non-perturbative treatment of the theory sorry, is, is obviously required if one wants to understand uh, the low energy hadron spectrum, the emergent phenomena in terms of the quarks and gluons, the fundamental variables. Okay, so why would you uh, think about lattice QCD? So the lattice discretization approach is a systematically improvable, non-perturbative formulation of QCD. So the lattice provides a regulator in the UV, also in IR. Uh, in principle, one can make calculations that are arbitrary precise. There are, of course, reasons why this isn't true in um, practically true, but we can understand um, in a formal way how to remove the uncertainties in these calculations. And of course it starts from first principles from the QCD Lagrangian. So this is not a model approach and the only inputs are the quark masses and the coupling. Um, one can turn that around and say that you can actually use the inputs then to explore the mass dependence and the coupling dependence in a very nice way, an avenue, for example, that's not open to experimentalists since these things are given by nature. Uh, but here we get to dial them up and down as we want. So what do we actually do? Um, so as I said already, we start from the Lagrangian. You know, I haven't included the theta term here. So this is the, the QCD Lagrangian. The cartoon over here is to show you how, um, how this might work. Um, so the gluons are the uh, are SU3 matrices. These are, you think of them as the links in the hypercube. These are parallel transporters. Uh, so the, the potential, the vector potential here is rewritten as this link variable uh, in this way through exponentiation like this. This is a path ordered uh, product of these, um, of these link variables. Uh, and here the quark fields then sit on the sides between the, the links. So they have, they carry all of the relevant uh, indices, so they have colour and flavour indices, Dirac indices, uh, and, and precisely how you do this, uh, how you visual, how you implement this, uh, these quark fields on the sites here in this cartoon, um, are, there are many different ways to do this. There are pros and cons for all of these. Wilson, of course, as the father of the theory, wrote down this formulation for Wilson fermions in the first instance. Uh, these Wilson fermions, fermions uh, explicitly break chiral symmetry, and so some of these other approaches are uh, different formulations that are an attempt to rewrite the quark fields with remnant chiral symmetry, or indeed, in some cases, full chiral symmetry. But they have uh, other disadvantages that, uh, in some cases, make you favor Wilson fermions. The point is that if you, however you do this, um, this discretization, once you remove the lattice, so once you take the continuum limit and recover the continuum underlying QCD theory, then these discretization methods should all agree. And that's what you saw in the earlier plot where all of these different uh, colored dots were from different formulations along these lines and uh, finally agree. Uh, the usual numerical thing is to replace derivatives with finite differences, in this case with the, uh, the link variables, ensuring that you have covariant derivatives in the simulation. So that's essentially the recipe, and then you solve the path integral on this finite lattice. So A is typically the, the lattice spacing, so this is non-zero. 
This is done stochastically using Monte Carlo techniques. Uh, the final uh, twist in this tale, if you like, is that this can only be done effectively in a Euclidean space-time metric, so I'll say a little bit about that in a minute, uh, where you have uh, essentially a probability weight that you can use in these stochastic estimations. But the observable that you might be interested in calculating is essentially given by this uh, path integral here. So it's the evaluation of this right-hand side object uh, that we uh, do numerically. Good question. Yep. And uh, see the term? Do you have a way to put it on a lattice? The see, the, see the term? Uh, it's a very a good question. Uh, yes and no is the answer. Um, it, uh, maybe I'll come back to I'll mention okay, it when I, go, when I go ahead. Okay. It, it, it essentially me it, it introduces a sign term, if you know what that is. Yes. And so this basically means that these Monte Carlo techniques don't really work very well. Yes, and so you have to find some other, yes, exactly. So you have to find some other right. way to do that. Right. Now, there are ideas about how you might do that for particular choices of theta, but not for general choices of theta. And I should also say, so if you look in theories other than uh, QCD, for example, so in um, SU2 theories, we can do this with, um, we can understand algorithms that allow you to introduce a theta term, for example, but just not in this full theory. Um, okay, so the observables that you want are determined from the path integral, something that looks like this. Um, so some subtleties here, the quark fields psi and psi bar uh, are Grassmann objects, and so we, uh, these are anti-commuting variables and um, computers don't like anti-commuting variables. You can't put these sorts of numbers, these sorts of objects uh, in a numerical simulation, and so you, what we do is to integrate them out. By integrating them out, you introduce a determinant of the fermion matrix, so this is M. Uh, here I've assumed that I have two flavors and th those two flavors have the same mass. So this is true if you think about uh, up and down quarks, the lightest quarks uh, in, the, in the QCD vacuum. Um, it allows me to write it down in a rather nice way like this. I should say that we also understand how to do uh, additional quark flavors, so including the C quark in this determinant and also even the charm quark as well now, but this is a rather nice way of writing it down in this particular case for uh, two flavors, with, where the two flavors have the same mass, so up and down. So it is this entire object actually that is uh, determined by important sampling, so the combination of this determinant that you see here uh, with this uh, gauge action in the exponent uh, can be interpreted as a, a probability weight so to see that uh, here the determinant is exponentiated by introducing some auxiliary bosonic fields and the whole thing is then rewritten uh, as, uh, as an exponent, introducing also some conjugate momenta for the uh, link variables. So it gets a little bit complicated, but in the end you have uh, something here which is positive definite and can therefore be used in important sampling. So that's the key step uh, to enable you to do that. Um, the, again, just to quickly mention, so this, uh, this, this part here, so this determinant piece here that we've introduced because of the Grassmann variables, integrating these out, um, this determinant piece um, introduces non-locality so that it, it, it couples the gauge fields in a non-local way. In this, uh, in this calculation, which means if from a numerical point of view, you can't do, if you remember back to any computational classes you did for the easing model where you do Metropolis and Hastings and all of these nice algorithms, uh, these rely on locality. And so instead here you have to, in fact, uh, it was recognized pretty early on, so lattice people uh, designed a, a, a new algorithm called a hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm to handle this non-locality. So there's some technical um, linear algebra that's basically hidden by what you see here. What is M? M is the fermion matrix, so d slash plus the quark mass, essentially. Uh, uh, okay, so um, if you do this, so you evaluate this in some stochastic way, uh, again, for uh, these important sampling, you have to demonstrate detailed balance and ergodicity in your algorithms, but anyway, if you do that, then the object that you're still interested in here, which is this expectation value of some um, observable O, uh, can be written as uh, the, just the average of the object that you're interested in, so this uh, observable evaluated on each of the stochastic samples that you've taken in the limit where you take a large number of these things. And so you can show that this is, uh, again, this is rigorously true with some correction terms that are understood uh, in the limit where n is not, uh, uh, when, when n is finite, not infinite. Uh, 
And in particular, you can show that that uh, uncertainty goes like one over the number of these snapshots that you're willing to generate. So we have a controllable, improvable statistical uncertainty in these Monte Carlo simulations. Calculating this uh, piece that I uh, wrote up here actually is what lattice people spend an awful lot of their cycles doing. So this takes about 80% of the compute cycles in the whole generation process, just doing this determinant piece that you see here. So if uh, some people here may remember that uh, in the early days of lattice calculations, uh, people talked a lot about the quenched approximation that essentially sets this entire piece here to one and throws it away. So you don't include quark annihilation diagrams in the simulation, um, but that's uh, completely, uh, we've moved on from there now. So the, this is no longer uh, part of any calculation anymore. So this, uh, most calculations are unquenched these days. Mm. So the sign problem now is under control? I mean, no. no, 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 no. So here, this is assuming everything here. So QCD here means QCD with zero chemical potential. So I haven't talked about the sign problem at all. What the sign, what the chemical potential does is, is to complexify this determinant piece. And then we don't know what to do because then the, the problem essentially is, is an algorithmic one, not a philosophical one or physics problem. Um, the problem is that this is complexified and now you have no positive definite weight for your Monte Carlo sampling. So the answer is no. no progress. No. I mean, there is progress to the extent that you can approximate <coughs> small values of the chemical potential, but that's not, a, that's not an algorithm. That's just an attempt to understand what's happening as you move a little bit out of the plane. So no, absolutely, it's an open problem. So everything that I talk about here is in terms of uh, zero chemical potential. Okay, so the objects again that we're interested in are these, let's say for example for mesons, we're interested in two point correlation functions. We build these out of operators, so this is psi bar psi uh, with some uh, Dirac structure in, uh, in here to give you the uh, object that you're interested in. So this gamma is an element of the Dirac algebra, but you can also include um, rather fancy versions of displacement. So you can have a quark and an anti-quark sitting at the same site, or you can pull them apart, or you can do fancier paths like this. And so this is what these operators would look like for these different scenarios. So you're completely free to do this. And uh, all of these will um, have particular uh, quantum numbers that they overlap with, and these all form part of uh, sort of a calculation that, that we do. So there's an immense freedom to design operators uh, in this way, so you don't just have to sit with everything sitting on the same side. Um, the, op the correlation function, the two-point correlation function then is, uh, is the expectation value of this creation and annihilation operator, which in terms of the quark field, so for some flavor indices, which I've just written here is A and B, I've suppressed the other indices just for clarity. So you have uh, psi bar psi, uh, at some value x, psi bar psi at zero, and this object is what you want to evaluate uh, for each of the stochastic ensembles that you've already generated. So uh, to make some progress here, we use Wick's theorem to contract the quark fields that you see in this operator, in this uh, correlation function. So by contracting the quark fields, we replace them with quark propagators. And so you see this is the same capital M, so this is the, uh, now the inverse of the fermion matrix, so D slash plus M, appearing uh, in here for some flavor that you get to choose, so A or B in this case. And the trace is over spin and color indices. So for non-flavor singlets, when A and B are different, um, this simplifies to this expression here. However, when A and B are the same, you can see that you, these, this term here in particular uh, remains. Uh, one thing just to, um, to maybe emphasize here is that the fermions enter in two different places in these lattice calculations. So they enter in the previous slide where I was talking about the determinant and the evaluation of the determinant. And then they enter again here where we talk about propagators. So here for these uh, correlation functions which are built out of quark fields which can be of any flavor. Um, okay, so then to actually evaluate this, uh, again, this correlation function, we in principle or in practice, sorry, what we do is to build uh, many of these operators using the cartoon that I showed you a little while ago as a sort of a, as a, a motivation. So you can imagine having a quark and an anti-quark on the same side, pulling them apart, doing random different paths like that with them. And you build up a 
uh, matrix of these operators. Um, and again, in this Euclidianized field theory, you can show that this uh, correlation function that you have written down essentially has this structure here. So it's a tower of exponentials with some stuff, some amplitude in front, which for the moment we won't worry too much about. The main thing to note here is that you see there's an exponential which has the energy that you might be interested in uh, upstairs. And so if you, uh, with a uh, factor of t, and so if you were interested in the ground state, so the lowest lying state in this particular channel, then you just have to wait long enough and then the uh, ground state exponential, the lowest exponential, will dominate in the correlation function. If you are interested in other things beyond the ground state, uh, then we solve a generalized eigenvalue problem with this uh, matrix of correlators and by diagonalizing that correlator matrix, you can extract eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and sh the eigenvalues are related to the energies again, it's the same energies that you see here, but in a more uh, straightforward way. So you can, each of the eigenvalues is then associated with one of the energies in the, um, this tower that you have here. And the eigenvectors are related to these overlap or these amplitude factors that you see in front here. So there's been a huge amount of work in the field actually to understand how, that this, how this actually works. So there's, there's a, a number of different issues which, I haven't, which I'm glossing over here. One is how do you actually construct in some sensible way these matrices of uh, operators. Uh, the second is to understand um, what the uncertainty is in this uh, generalized eigenvalue problem in this uh, solution. So how do the energy eigenvalues relate, to, how do the eigenvalues relate to the energies that you're interested in and uh, with some correction factor. And then the final piece of work that has only recently happened is to understand how to use these overlaps. Previously we just sort of threw them away and didn't worry about them, is to use these overlaps in fact to help you to identify uh, states in the lattice calculation. Okay, so very often you hear lattice people, in fact, I've already been doing it, talking about, uh, oh, you know, we need big computers and everything takes a long time. Um, so, um, so this slide is just an attempt to sort of say why uh, or show you at least what's happening. Um, so this is a, the computational cost of some lattice calculation, in particular of the part where we're calculating the determinant. So uh, there was a couple of slides ago. So of course it depends on the number of these stochastic samples that you're going to calculate, but that's uh, actually not the problem. The problem is over here when you start to think about how it scales with some of the things that you control. Okay? So you control, for example, the size of the box in which you're willing to do your simulation, um, but the cost scales like the volume to uh, well, L to the power 5, so the size of the box with a fifth power. It also scales with the lattice spacing. Again, that's not unexpected, but it scales rather badly with the lattice spacing. So it scales with this seventh power here, A inverse. A is the lattice spacing, remember? So as you decrease the lattice spacing, which is moving towards the continuum theory, the cost is growing by a rather enormous factor. And finally, the cost also grows with so m pi here, the pion mass, is a proxy for the quark mass in the determinant. And you see again that this, as you go towards physical to very light values of the quark mass, which is like physical pion masses, this scales again with a very uncomfortable factor of uh, six upstairs. The combination of this scaling, uh, which is built from, some of it is uh, certainly physics, so m pi, for example, scales like the quark mass, um, square root of quark mass, but some of it is algorithmic and some of it is geometric scaling. But the combination is uh, essentially what the 80% the of the computational time uh, that these lattice calculations are doing, where it's, where it's going to. Uh, this has a name, so this was called the Berlin Wall. Um, mostly because it was discussed at a lattice conference in Berlin, so it's, it's a little bit dull in that sense, but actually um, the wall was, the, was the, the wall that you hit in this computational cost as you try to scale down in uh, to light pions, large boxes and small lattice spacings. So why isn't L over A to the fourth the correct scaling? Yeah, so it's algorithmic, but... So there's a so there's a there's a there's an additional factor again partly because of the non-locality in the determinant so that affects sort of everything I mean it brings additional the way you handle the determinant brings additional factors of a and l into this. Um. Uh, excuse me, 
why why uh, the, the, that combination of the parameters is dimensionful? Uh, no, sorry, sorry. The C, yeah. So the C here is some parameter that is will have dimensions to, yeah, to, to fix that. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. Okay, so so this is the Berlin Wall. Essentially, um, I, I'll show you in a little while that that the wall has come down, um, and in fact, we at least understand how to to beat some of these um, how to beat some of these uh, uncomfortable factors uh, in this uh, in this equation. Um, however, it, uh, it doesn't actually stop at that point. So once you do all of this work up here, then you have to do the calculation of the correlation functions, which again requires you to invert uh, this um, fermion matrix, as you saw a couple of slides ago. Um, and so you have some things that you need to worry about. You need a box that's big enough for whatever it is you're trying to calculate, for so beyond, you know, larger than uh, at least one Fermi much larger usually these days, and you need to have a lattice spacing which is much smaller than the volume of the box that you're uh, simulating. So a typical sort of volume might be 32 to the 4, uh, that's already um, over a million sites, and of course your fermion fields have Dirac components, colors, and then the combination finally in this Dirac matrix is usually, or easily, sorry, is, uh, this sort of size. So this is the matrix that you have to then invert on each of the configurations that you generated at this cost up here. So the whole thing is uh, an enormous, hugely uh, intensive uh, co computational cost, but it's also highly parallelizable, so it's very suitable for these sorts of machines. Uh, this is Titan in the US, where a lot of the calculations have been done. So it, it scales very well um, on these large machines. And just to prove it's been around for a long time, so here's a snapshot of uh, QCD from the early days, lattice QCD from the very first numerical simulation, so everything was quenched. You can see the boxes were relatively small. Uh, so we're up here, and then there's the machines are somehow keeping track of, of all of this as well. So the boxes get bigger as the machines get bigger. And uh, um, here you see that the box now is about six Fermi and is rather large a uh, number of sites. Uh, and this is at the stage of the what they call the fifth generation or blue gene, uh, IBM's blue gene machine. So more recently, this is Summit. This is in the US. This is uh, um, uh, an almost exascale machine. So this runs at uh, a few hundred petaflops, where a petaflop is about 10 to the 16 floating point operations per second. So this is, uh, at least last year, was the top, was the fastest supercomputer in the world. It's also one of the greenest supercomputers, so that's also quite nice. Uh, no, no, seriously, this is a big thing now. So these machines have to be not just fast, but green as well. They have to be energy efficient because um, they use an enormous amount of power. And then this one here in a box uh, doesn't quite exist yet. This is coming in 2021. This is the first exascale machine. This will be doing 10 to the 18 uh, flops, so floating point operations per second. And to go from here, so this is about 200 petaflops to over 1,000 petaflops in three years is the ambition. Uh, and it's really rather significant to try to imagine how to, uh, to make that transition uh, in, this, in these sort of numerical calculations. And the final goal is to compute some matrix element, or where, what's the...? For lattice people? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, maybe I'll say at the end, but, but yeah, so I mean, we've, we've moved long beyond uh, just reproducing what experiment does. Um, that was, that's already a, a sort of, you know, uh, I would say proven. Um, so matrix elements are already calculated and they were part of, for example, that uh, plot that I showed you for the CKM matrix element. Uh, but there are many other uh, similar quantities, for example, contributions to G minus two, the anomalous magnetic moment of the, of the muon, where there the matrix elements are rather complicated objects. Uh, they have a light by light uh, structure in them and they're, they're extremely difficult to calculate. They have many, they have vacuum polarization diagrams as well. So this is a very difficult problem. And this is, I'd say, at the early, lattices at the early days of these. And I'll show you some other things where we're at the early stages of trying to understand how to make the calculations. So these, of course, the bigger computers help. Um, but as you saw maybe in the earlier slides, you also have to be quite clever about how you do the algorithms because if you just wait for these big machines, then um, you won't really make very much progress. You have to also improve the algorithms as well. Um, okay, so this is a long list of, um, so of lattice collaborations, which is not important really, uh, but just to show you that this is the Berlin Wall coming down, although maybe not as so obviously. So here's the physical point. This is the pion mass. Um, and this is the lattice spacing here. So you want to be down here, right? This is a pion mass in MeV, 
at zero lattice spacing. And the lattice calculations are all up here. So of course they're not at finite lattice spacing, which would be down here, so they're still at uh, fine, but not, uh, but not close to zero yet. Um, but they are at physical pion masses, so I'm not sure if it's uh, so clear, but this, these, there are certainly some points which are very close to the pion mass, there are some points which are at the pion mass, and there are some points which are actually even lower than the pion mass, because again, you can dial this number up and down in your simulation if you want to. Um, okay, so what can we actually do? So this is a little bit maybe towards, towards your question. Um, so you can think about lattice calculations in uh, maybe three different boxes. So here's two of them at least. So below thresholds, strong decay thresholds, uh, everything behaves nicely. You have bound states. You can use well-tried, well-tested. Everything is, works very nicely. Everything, typically you have high statistics, uh, highly improved actions. Everything is very precise. You get rid of all of the systematic uncertainties. You take continuum extrapolations. You take volume extrapolations, you work at physical like work, you sort of take care of everything. So this uh, really is, um, these are, as I said, the gold-plated things. And, and even to the extent these days where you can include QED, really put QED and non-compact uh, QED in the simulation as well. Um, above thresholds, then uh, life is a little bit more complicated, of course. So here we need to have many more <laughs> sophisticated and um, different operators than we've had in the past and there's been some developments there. Typically this is a sort of a little bit like seat of the pants stuff, you're trying things out, you're trying to understand new methods and how they work to get you uh, to understand so that you can understand resonance physics. Typically there's no continuum extrapolation, everything is done with non-physical, unphysical pion masses uh, and of course you make, try to make improvements as you learn how to do these calculations but they're rather different to what's going on here. And then there's uh, this piece where we have uh, the sign problem for finite density calculations where Monte Carlo uh, really isn't valid and there are at least at the moment no good ideas for how to make progress there. Um, and a, a second uh, rather interesting area uh, to think about is how you understand scattering at finite temperature. So as the, um, at finite temperature the box, uh, we, we have a Matsubara formulation so that you identify the temporal direction with the temperature and so you change the temperature by squeezing the box essentially um, and understanding how you do scattering in that scenario is um, again terra incognita. So here um, new ideas that we've already had in some sense. So new ideas have proved absolutely crucial here. So making progress in the um, threshold in, in resonance physics has not been because the computers have got better or bigger or faster. It's because we have much better algorithms that actually are tuned to allow us to do these sorts of calculations. So distillation is a beautiful example. So this had its 10th birthday in uh, Dublin. It was invented in Dublin. So we celebrated it last year. Uh, it gave access to a whole range of exotic physics that hadn't previously been accessible and set up this whole uh, field of scattering physics in uh, lattice calculations. Uh, the temperature, what's the, I mean, the real temperature which are necessary in QCD, what's the, what it is like, 20 to Kelvin? Oh, so, um, well the, so the phase transition is at about, uh, it's about 157 MeV, so I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, so we can go from essentially, well, it's, it's not quite zero, but close to zero uh, temperature all the way up past the phase transition and to maybe about 2 TC in these lattice calculations. That's uh, like it's 10 to the 10 Kelvin or so. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, well, one, yeah. one EV is 10 to the 4, four yeah, Kelvin, the and then, you know. Yeah. So this is you know, cosmological temperatures, early universe. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, these, so the, the, the calculations, that most of the calculations that I'm talking about are at low temperature, so they're well below that transition temperature, but then as you go up, that's right, yeah. Um, okay. So let me show you some um, spectroscopy then. So uh, these are the familiar things that you would uh, want to talk about. So there are mesons and baryons built from quarks and antiquarks mm -hmm. in the usual way. But QCD, of course, doesn't, isn't restricted to these combinations, so you can build um, hadronic objects, observables, in, in many different ways, including from glue balls, from gluons, gluon fields only. You can have combinations of quarks and antiquarks with excited glue, so these are hybrids, tetraquark objects and mo uh, molecular objects where you have uh, these tightly bound uh, structures within some sort of uh, looser molecular object. <laughs> I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they do actually. Yes. 
they have same effect for over maybe yes yeah, maybe <laughs> yes yeah. well you have to tell me that i obviously can't comment on that <laughs> okay so now this is a little bit technical as well but just to give you a sense of the things that you have to think about uh, again in these lattice calculations so you know of course we work in a finite box in a finite grid spacing so so somehow, sorry, these, uh, the graphics have come out a little bit funny, but this is the picture that you should think about. So if you wanted to reach the continuum, then uh, you need to understand how you relate, uh, how you change the box size. So you go in, for example, from a rather coarse lattice to finer and finer. But then you also want to take an infinite volume limit where you keep the lattice spacing, the grid size the same, but you increase the box size. So those are the two limits, the relevant limits. Um, one can sit at finite values of the lattice spacing and use, uh, for example, semantic improvement procedures to reduce the size of the discretization uncertainty uh, by introducing uh, irrelevant operators at finite lattice spacing. Um, and that's, a, again, a well, um, well-trodden path in these lattice calculations. But ultimately, you want to demonstrate that you can take this continuum limit. So, of course, it means that you have to repeat the calculation many times. Um, but it's necessary for these precision physics that uh, I talked about a little bit. Okay, so maybe um, more interestingly, you can you need, would like to simulate at the physically relevant quark masses. Uh, this comes at a computational cost. So I mentioned, at least alluded to the light quark cost, where the light quarks appear in the fermion determinant. And so, uh, in fact, the condition number, you have to invert that matrix, and the condition number of that matrix scales with the uh, the light quark mass, so as you reduce the light quark mass, the condition number of the matrix that you're trying to invert um, gets larger and larger and, and quickly becomes a very difficult problem. So that's an algorithmic issue with uh, light quark simulations. For heavy quarks, those heavy quarks have a scale, again, with a, um, have discretization uncertainties that are proportional to the lattice spacing. That's true in the light quark sector too, but A times a small number is not so bad, but A times a big number, if it's a bottom quark, um, is a problem and can quickly swamp your calculations. So you have to understand the heavy quark systematics, which is often done through effective field theory methods like non-relativistic QCD or even static approximations, for example. Um, the last relevant point here, I've already talked about the working in Euclidean time, but the Lorentz symmetry is, of course, broken uh, at finite lattice spacing. So that means that the relevant symmetry group to classify, for example, hadronic objects in terms of the ir irreducible representations is not the continuum group, but instead is the symmetry group of the cube, so um, OH or O3. And we have to define operators and identify states according to the symmetry group of the cube rather than the symmetry group uh, of the continuum. And then there's a piece of work that allows you that you have to do to understand how to go from here back to here, essentially. So again, if you um, uh, the, the, essentially the problem here is that here you have an infinite tower of uh, spin values which correspond to the irreducible representations of this continuum group, but the cubic group has five irreducible representations, and so all of those spin values, all of the J values, are mapped onto the five irreducible representations that uh, characterize this symmetry group. And so you have to understand how to disentangle all of those degeneracies so that you can relate a state on the lattice to a state in the continuum. So it um, can be tricky. And then this I already said, we're working in Euclidean time uh, so that we have this positive definite uh, weight and can do these Monte Carlo calculations. Uh, and this in also gives you access, allows you to, uh, to write the correlation function as this uh, sums of uh, exponentials, but it also means that you lose direct access to scattering matrix elements um, in a Euclidean field theory. So this is, of course, well known, but um, there is an indirect approach to this now through the work by Lucher and others that followed. <coughs> In my student times, there was a problem because it's so crude and everything, the, the grip of copies and so on. Is it still there? But this is only if, you, if you're gauge fixing, right? But don't, this is a gauge invariant theory, so you don't need to gauge fix. Not, not no. No. So you only need to gauge fix if, for example, you're interested in the gluon propagator. If you're interested in the gluon <coughs> propagator, then you have to gauge fix. And there you have to be careful about Grieboff copies, for example. In fact, so one of my uh, thesis projects was on a, an algorithm to uh, specifically avoid these Grieboff copies in sure. gate lattice okay. calculations. Too much of something, then oh. you need to. If you, I mean, if you want to match the calculations of lattice with the perturbative calculations, then you need propagators.
Right, so if you're doing that, then you have to gauge fix, yes. So for gluon propagators, for things like that, then yes, indeed, you have to gauge fix. But typically, all of this is gauge invariant, right? And so when it's gauge invariant, you, you don't need to worry about that. And that's yeah, what Peggy, if you, see, you, you, you have to sum over all the possible U configurations, and there's a huge redundancy. So how do you avoid summing over the same things? Uh, maybe, I'd, so say that again, sorry, I don't... Like, given configurations of U's, maybe gauge equivalent to another configuration of U's. They are overcounting the same the, 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 the volumes, the gauge group is a factor. So you're summing over yields, right? Over all the possible link variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the space of link variables has a huge redundancy. Yeah, no, no, but, you, but you're stochastically sampling. Uh, uh, so. Maybe this yeah. no. sample it doesn't matter, right? It, the, the, yeah. the partition function factorizes out. It doesn't right. matter. So but you can maybe cut out a huge number of things that you're overcounting. Maybe you're. With you should. Well, but I mean, so, you, yeah. Maybe you want to only sample over gauge non-equivalent link configurations, no? Probably when they divide them by partition. Yeah, but it, it yeah, so. They divide by partition, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think it's a, uh, I'm not quite sure it's the same problem because in the Monte Carlo calculation, you're not quite summing over all the gauge link configurations. You're, it's weighted, don't forget, with a, probability distribution. So you're, you're sampling from that weighted set of, um, of link variables. So I think it's probably not quite the same, but I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so uh, actually Gregory mentioned glue ball, so I, I left, I'm glad I left this in. But anyway, so this is an early success of all of these lattice ideas. So here are lots of different operators. Um, in this uh, Yang-Mills theory, and you see indeed that you can extract these very nice uh, spectrum of states. Uh, this is from uh, a very long time ago now. Uh, this is actually even a quench calculation, so um, it's quite ancient history, but still somehow relevant. This uh, is before Mike came to uh, Trinity. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, this I won't dwell on because it hasn't come out very well, so let me show you this one instead. Um, so this is... Uh, more recent work where we can then determine what an exotic meson might look like. This is with um, CC bar content, so charmonium states. So here's a regular CC bar, uh, and here is a sort of a cartoon of a hybrid where you have some excited gluonic content in the, between the Q and the Q bar. And so what you see here is um, a rather busy plot, but first of all, the black lines are what we know experimentally. So you see that you know some things experimentally, but actually you don't know very much experimentally. And then the rest are the results of lattice calculations. So the green um, boxes are um, simple QQ bar type objects. And then the colored in either red or in blue are states that we identify as hybrids. Uh, so these uh, states that appear, if you, again, if you know your QCD uh, nomenclature, you'll see that these are uh, regular quark model states with JPC values but also a, an explicitly exotic channel, which is this 1 minus plus, and is not allowed in quark models, but is allowed by QCD, for example. So you can calculate what a state would look like in that particular exotic channel. And you see that there's a plethora of these things which you can calculate on the lattice, which await uh, some experimental input now to understand um, how, whether they're real or, or what the values of these things are, or indeed what the structure of them is. Um, Again, there are some faded lines here which are indicating the thresholds, the thresholds for strong decay in charmonium to uh, DD bar type states. Um, but in this uh, sort of naive approach, we've treated everything as, uh, as a bound state. So here are some current challenges. Yep, nearly done. So if I wanted to go beyond, so here, let me just again just say, so everything here is, the assumption is it looks like this. So it is sort of QQ bar in some bound state configuration like this. You might put some exotic things in between the Q and Q bar, but I don't worry about the fact that I'm sitting above decay thresholds or I don't allow that to affect the calculation. Of course, that's not actually reasonable. Everything is more or less, all states are resonances. And so what we need to understand is how to, to calculate these spectroscopy this spectroscopy in the presence of or allowing for resonances and scattering states. And I mentioned previously that this Euclidean theory, um, essentially uh, you lose access directly to the scattering matrix element. Um, and so the solution to this uh, is in fact found uh, initially by Lucia, who was written down in 1991. There was earlier work uh, by others 
uh, in um, non-relativistic quark models, for example. But Lucia was the first to formulate this, at least for a QCD uh, application. Um, and so what he, what he showed was that you can relate, you can turn the fact that you live in this finite box with the discrete spectrum of energy levels to your advantage and relate the information that you extract in the lattice calculation, which are essentially these energy levels at some particular box size L or momenta P, where that's the uh, overall momentum of the system. You can relate that uh, to um, phase information, the phase shift uh, in infinite volume. So this uh, relationship is through this function phi, which is some generalized zeta function. Um, which you wrote down. Practically what that means is that you calculate lots of energy levels, so lots of these energy levels at lots of different values of L, and the more points you have, you use this formula then to allow you to translate from these energy levels to the phase shift. And so you see that the more points that you have in this calculation, the more points you have in this uh, phase shift, and so you map it out much uh, more cleanly. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, you might wonder why it's taken so long to actually do this. So from 1991, nobody did anything for a very long time. So people tried at the beginning, uh, in the early 90s, to do something, and it didn't work at all. And then nothing happened until um, about 10 years ago. And so about 10 years ago, this distillation algorithm actually uh, opened the door to this by allowing the determination of these energy levels in, in a very precise and rather beautiful way, um, which meant that you could finally implement this uh, Lucia method. So that's been a real growth area. So there's lots of, I picked two particular examples which are interesting, uh, at least as a lattice person, they're interesting. Um, so this is a, an isoscalar in pi pi scattering. Um, it's a little bit tricky to see here, but again, so I apologize. So these are two different quark masses. So remember that we have complete freedom to dial the quark mass up and down. And what you see here is that, uh, so this is the uh, heavier quark mass, and this is the lighter quark mass. You see rather different behavior for this particular state, depending on the quark mass. So we see this is the sigma. It evolves from some bound state um, to uh, a resonance at lighter masses. So this is what these pictures are showing you, but you see that you can understand some of the resonance physics by just changing the quark mass in a very nice way. And these are some of the wick contractions that you have to do, but that's um, less uh, interesting perhaps. Um, so here is the row resonance, something that everybody has seen hopefully before. This is a very well-determined thing uh, experimentally, of course. And here again, you see the effect of different quark masses. So you can change the quark mass and see the row resonance really appear in the calculation. So of course, this is interesting to see when you know the answer. It's even more interesting when you don't really know what's happening to see how the resonance behavior depends as a function of the quark mass. When you change yeah. the quark mass, mm. you keep the condensate value constant, or you also move that? Um, so yeah, yeah, so that also moves. Oh. Yeah. Also, I see. Uh, no, sorry. Yes, it does. It also moves, yes. Although it doesn't play, I'm not sure what role it would play here. Well, in row it will play, yeah. in proton it will, you know, play even more so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. So it, it definitely changes, but uh, I'm not sure it's been tracked in some, in any systematic way. As the, con the condensate itself hasn't been tracked in, yeah. No, it's a good point, actually. Yeah. Okay, so let me just finish then with the, uh, Things that we might do, and, um, and then finally things that um, are more speculative. So here's something that uh, I think is reasonable to imagine doing, given the slide that I just showed you where we can understand how to do scattering. This is nothing to do with the lattice calculation. This is the set of experimentally measured and ex or expected masses in the charmonium system, which it is assumed uh, is uh, reasonably well understood through potential models, for example. And so the different colors are, the yellow are things that are established and measured, uh, predicted by theory and measured. Uh, white boxes are those which have been predicted in some quark model calculations but aren't discovered yet. And everything else is new, undiscovered, unexpected and to some extent possibly unwanted. Uh, so these were discovered in experiments from about 2003 onwards by uh, Bell, then Best, then LHC. Um, they are sitting above strong decay thresholds. It's completely unclear what they are. So one might imagine that they could be some molecular states, uh, even some tetraquark states are postulated. 
But interestingly, most of them are also extremely narrow, which would mean that they're not necessarily a, a loose sort of conglomeration of, of um, die quarks, for example, but rather have some much more tightly bound structure that is not uh, what you might expect above the decay thresholds. So this uh, is completely unknown, um, at least at the moment. We don't understand what these states are. This is a perfect place for a lattice calculation to actually make some progress to understand what these are. And these are a finite temperature calculation. Um, so here what we looked at was the bottomonium spectrum, so BB bar spectrum as you dial up the temperature. So this is T over TC. And you can see in each pane as you move from left to right and top to bottom, the temperature is increasing <coughs> from T over TC is about 0.4 uh, to 1 and then up to, uh, to higher and higher values of TC until you have T over TC is about 2. And you see that the, the main points to take away here are that the um, the peak, which is the ground state here, is, uh, is um, shrinking and broadening, which is um, commensurate with melting and suppression of the state in the, in the medium, in the quark gluon plasma. Um, what we don't understand at all is how, for example, such a state might scatter. How do you understand um, if this is a resonance, not a bound state, how this behaves in the plasma. So these are completely open questions. Um, very interesting questions. There are a lot of subtleties here about recombination effects from melting and how that feeds into scattering calculations, um, which again are only beginning to be discussed by um, in, in a lattice uh, setup. So since uh, coffee, I, and I know I'm standing between you and, and coffee, so um, maybe let me just finish. With, um, with some perspective. So I split this into um, along the lines of computing because lattice people are always expected to talk about computers. So I thought I would say something about the, the two sorts of computing that I see on the horizon. Um, we are sitting somehow at an amazing point where computing is really radically changing. Um, both classically and in terms of quantum computing. So at a classical level, this exascale computing that we'll see within two years uh, is absolutely not business as usual. So we cannot just take the code we have, put it on the big machine and press go. It will not work. Nothing will work. We need new algorithms. The workflows will be different. Everything is going to be very different on these machines. So this is, um, of course, a huge challenge but it brings with it many, many exciting possibilities to do, of course, more precision determinations of matrix elements, to calculate matrix elements that we simply cannot do at the moment, um, and to understand, for example, this spectral reconstruction uh, problem that I showed you a little bit in finite temperature just a while ago, uh, which is currently limited because it's an ill-posed problem. So this is a transformation from um, how you go from a, an object where you have a limited number of discrete points to a continuum object, which is the spectral function for these uh, finite temperature states. So all of this is somehow, um, I think, uh, a really exciting time in just in, from a classical perspective. And since, again, everybody uh, always mentions these words these days, so lattice people, of course, are also using or in investigating how we might use machine learning techniques and AI in convergence with all of this HPC business uh, to improve what we're trying to do. Quantum computing uh, is, of course, a further horizon, but nevertheless um, an increasing pr prospect for numerical simulations. Not fake news, it's not no, I know it's uh, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, uh, so IBM has a machine now with 53 or something qubits. Google has 70 or so. I mean, these machines are getting bigger and bigger. There are many really interesting problems to understand. In particular, um, quantum error correction is a huge problem that I don't think is fully under control yet at all. Um, reproducibility is a problem. I mean, there are many really interesting problems, but it, the, the possibilities are also very interesting because this sign problem, for example, may be a very nice uh, um, uh, problem that you can reimagine in this uh, quantum computing scenario. And in particular, uh, we might, for example, make some progress in the Grassmann integration where, where those variables would be something that we could imagine, that integration we could imagine doing in a quantum computing way that removes the determinant part. So the determinant came because of the Grassmann integration that we did analytically. If we now numerically evaluate these Grassmann integrals, then there's a possibility that we can sort of subvert uh, the, the, 
the determinant calculation and therefore understand a little bit more, for example, about the sign problem and indeed how we did calculate these determinants as well. So, the, so this is a, a, a I mean, I, this is very speculative, I should say, but it's a real, a very interesting question for uh, lattice calculations. Um, there's also been some work on regularization, uh, alternative regularizations of the path integral using zeta functions. Um, and a very likely model is that you have a quantum accelerator in some sort of classical system. So you send a bit of your calculation off to the quantum computer and you wait for it to come back and then you go on and do your uh, classical thing. But as I said, these are perspectives. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. So it's very interesting. OK, last thing. Samson, happy birthday. This is a birthday card that, uh, because I'm so useless, I actually forgot to bring with me, but uh, it is sitting at home on my desk. Um, I, I did manage to get it scanned, though, so you can see what it looks like. Uh, so this is the front of the birthday card, and it's been signed by all your colleagues uh, in the School of Maths. So happy birthday, Samson. <laughs> Question. You explain Euclidean formulation. It is difficult to refer only to Mikoski. To go back to Minkowski. Um, so, <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, so we typically you typically don't. I mean, you can. Um, um, well, y no, you can formally at least understand how to do it, um, but numerically not. Um, but you can also argue that you don't need to because you satisfy the positivity constraints and so... Well, it's not an interesting dynamic question. In so the, yeah. the last you kind of put on both for better and then exactly. take away, so, you know, quench. So there are there's some, real, there's some interesting real-time questions yeah, that right, this, right, yeah, right. exactly, that this Euclidean formulation sort of rules out, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least at a direct way, uh, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does it make sense to make relations with perturbative calculations? No, no, no. Perturbative calculations give increased precision results? Yes, so, so there's, I, I didn't mention it here, but there's, I mean, so for sure there's a, there's a, a synergy between perturbative calculations and they're, they're used extensively in lattice calculations as well, both as uh, ways to calculate the coefficients of improvement terms, for example, and matrix element, renormalization factors in matrix elements. So there's absolutely, it's a whole, yeah. I second the question about the sociology of the field. I mean, do <laughs> everyone the same calculations, or are there different methods, or how much discussion is there about the results? Um, and is there agreement every time? Or no. <laughs> no, but just I mean, just to know how this is. It's it, so um, since there are no other lattice people here, I can say it's a, a deeply self-critical field. Um, where nothing is is taken for granted. So for a start, there are many different. Hmm? Yeah. So there are many different collaborations and they will work on different formulations. So in the very early uh, slides, I had Wilson, Staggered, Overlap, Fermions, etc. So these are all different groups doing different approaches to the same physics, for example. And then, of course, they check to see whether they get the same answer. But also there are fundamental sort of more theoretical arguments about whether aspects of, for example, Staggered Fermion formulations are really um, you can really formally show that they recover QCD in some continuum limits. So there are long-running uh, arguments, I would say, about these sorts of implementations, including also the implementation of uh, um, how you understand chiral symmetry, uh, how you understand heavy quark physics and effective field theories. So the, the field is actively um, uh, discussing amongst itself all of these issues. Very self-critical, actually, uh, I would say. Uh -huh. <laughs> when this will develop and develop and eventually will become like competing with experiment, hmm. compete in the prediction. Well, it already does. Okay, so experiment has to verify. Yes. And that's already happening, Samson. So I didn't show here, but uh, in. No, no. I mean, there's. Oh, look, I mean, it's very nice if you can make predictions and then find these states experimentally. Of course, that's very nice. But also, there's an interplay between experiment and physics, where experiments will measure branching ratios, and for example, QCD provides lattice QCD provides hadronic matrix elements, and it's the combination of those two things that gives you the CKM matrix elements. So in that case, we don't, we can't really access the branching fractions that they can measure. They can't calculate or access the hadronic matrix elements. So that's an example of a nice synergy. But um, I, I, I don't think it's one or the other. Why is there age in accounting? Ah, <coughs> so it's the anglicised version of uh, how you would say it uh, in uh, in Irish. So this is Brella Hanna Dithre Hamson, but. Uh, 
Ha. Mm. Happy birthday, Samson. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's thank. Thank you.